from AFRL. Um, so I just talked about effectiveness, obviously. Um, I'm going to pivot a little bit now, and I'm going to talk about the design of power and thermal management systems. Um, as I mentioned before, we deal with alphabet soup, so if I say PTMS a lot, that's what I'm referring to. And specifically, I'm going to be talking about <clears throat> efforts that we've had ongoing to um, you know, move towards gradient-based optimization of power and thermal su um, subsystems. Um, this is actually a highly collaborative work. Um, so just to explain the authorship order here, um, honestly, the authorship could be somewhat interchangeable because certain papers, one person was the first name author and other papers the other person was. But I'm going to be talking a lot about the tool design today. And um, obviously also the application, but a lot of the, the emphasis is going to be on tool design, and that was really done um, almost entirely by Chris, uh, Chris Axland at the University of Illinois, um, who started out as uh, a summer intern at AFRL, and then we sort of just kept working together because it worked really quite nicely. And obviously um, this work is together with uh, Dan Clark, who's also at AFRL, and then uh, Andrew Lean who used to be at UIUC and is uh, Chris Axlin's advisor, but has since moved to uh, the University of Minnesota. So, similar as I did before, I certainly want to go through a motivation for the work um, that I'm going to be describing today. I'm going to uh, be talking about existing tools in the space. Um, and then I'm going to be talking about the initial tool design that we had, that we came up with together, and then um, the revised approach that uh, Chris took once he went back to Illinois. Um, after that, I'll be going very, very briefly and very high level through some studies, um, probably mainly pointing you towards papers if you're interested because each study itself probably could be a 20 minute com uh, conversation. And then ultimately, I want to go through um, some cl concluding remarks which include, you know, what we learned from this um, and then where I think the contributions of this work really lie certainly from, from our perspective, uh, or my perspective at AFRL. So let's start with the motivation um, for this work. <clears throat> so if you've sat through a Mystic presentation, there's a good chance you've seen a graph like this. This is, um, you know, we have an S-curve that, um, uh, that denotes confidence in design uh, performance or effectiveness, if, you, if that's your uh, jazz, um, over design progress or time. So, um, you know, you, you, one can obviously map this in a more formal context uh, to milestones in design programs and acquisition programs, which is sort of more government speak. But if we just look at the design aspect of any vehicle, we start out with conceptual design and preliminary design where, you know, there's still a lot of uncertainty in terms of the actual performance of the system or the effectiveness of the system. And then as time goes along and we add more disciplines, we get more confidence in, uh, in our design performance and we start to hone in on what we hope is the, the end performance of the system. That would be fine. The only problem is what I'm not showing here is the cost curve, which is that you know, it really explodes toward, as we go to the right. So one of the things we really want to do, and this is, this is often what comes up in uh, you know, mystic charts, um, you know, CCA, VD reviews, et cetera, is um, we want to move the S curve both up and to the left. And um, I, I believe that a lot of what we're showing today, and I'll go into detail how, but a lot of what we're showing today in this context um, actually starts to move in that direction. Um, and one, one way to, to do this, obviously, is to include more disciplines early in the, in the design. And obviously, I'm talking about PTMS modeling today. Um, so one of the challenges we see um, is that we really have to model pretty complex systems. Um, this, is, this is not my graph. This is uh, taken from a publication from Abu Mali, who's also at AFRL. This is a turboprop model. This is also not probably even the most complex PTMS system out there, but they can get quite complex. And on the vehicle side, we're not in the business of designing PTMS systems. Conversely, a lot of PTMS design or designers are not in the business of either vehicle integration or for that matter, gradient-based optimization. Um, so 
we really have this, and th this may sound familiar, whether it's you know NPSS um, and engines, and um, and uh, Pi cycles. You get sort of this gap between the experts who are using one tool, say NPSS, and the optimization experts who are using Pi cycle, which is gradient based. So we're running into the same problem here. Um, so we have complex model, uh, systems we have to model, but even bigger problem for us is that we can't push the design to the right. Um, so obviously, um, one graph here is, shown, is, is from Rob's work in 2017, I believe that's the Maxwell design, um, which showed that the, um, you have to model the, the power and thermal um, systems because otherwise you end up in a thermally limited aircraft. Um, I believe that was the takeaway. Uh, Rob can correct you if, if I'm wrong on that. Um, then, uh, then John, you know, our YouTube star back there, um, he, he dealt with PTMS modeling as well in his dissertation work uh, back in 2018 where he um, saw much of the same. You know, ultimately, if you don't consider the power and thermal uh, management, you're going to run into problems if later on when you produce that aircraft. At least that's my takeaway from that. Um, I will say that these are, you know, optimization examples, and they also just happen to be from the open MDO space. There are, there's plenty of work on this in the PTMS space that comes to the same conclusion, which is basically you need to do coupled design, which, if you go back to the S curve that I mentioned before, means we have to move it left, essentially. I mean, in all likelihood, it'll, it'll move left in, in the graph. So we have to do um, coupled design um, otherwise, we're going to end up with an underperforming vehicle later on, which is going to be very, very, very expensive to fix. Um, at the same time, we kind of run into the problem that, generally speaking, when we deal with PTMS systems in, in gradient-based optimization, the systems have been relatively simple. And I'm not taking a shot at the systems that were modeled because I think that it's great work. I will say, however, that if we compare this against someone who is a PTMS expert, where they're doing feedback controllers, where they're doing valves, et cetera, the systems are still very simple. And so um, we end up in this situation where we have to trade fidelity, where we are currently trading fidelity for the tools that we have here. And this is something we wanted to address in this context. Um, so. The next part, I'll be giving you an overview of tool development. This really happened in two steps. I mentioned Chris was um, at AFRL as a summer um, student. And when I say at AFRL, because of COVID, that was not so much a location-based thing, but maybe more in thought, um, because he actually had to do it remotely. Um, having said that, um, we started out from the point of view that, you know, there are existing tools. And um, I break them down by academia and industry. Um, I'll come back to why that might not be the best way of breaking it down, but in, in, in academia, you know, one uh, given way of doing it is a graph-based uh, modeling approach, which we'll go into in a second, but this does allow to model complex systems. It, unfortunately, until now, has not provided, typically speaking, gradients for optimization, so optimization with those tools has been gradient-free. Um, on the other hand, we've seen more recently, uh, optimization-based tools. I'm mainly familiar one, with ones in Python and OpenMDAO, um, which are you know, very nice for conceptual level design. But at the same time, they still are relatively simple systems as I mentioned before. But on the upside, they do provide gradients for optimization, which, as I mentioned before, the PTMS, uh, PTMS experts so far have not or had not. Then on the other side, um, we have industry, which uses, and this is why I say it's maybe not the best breakdown, is because a lot of work that starts in academia from the PTMS experts actually flows into industrial applications. But we have you know, Simulink and MATLAB-based tools. Um, they still do allow the com um, creation of complex systems. Um, also, simulation and time, which in this case, I believe all tools do. But they also don't provide gradients. So we really want to bridge this gap. Um, with this work. So I mentioned graph-based models. Um, let me just briefly explain what I'm talking about in this context. Um, 
Also bear in mind that I'm not a PTMS expert, um, so I'll try my best explaining this, but if we go into the weeds on this, I may have to give you an email address for you to have correspondence with Chris because this is not my field. Um, so basically each component or each, each system can be broken down into a directed graph. So in this case, uh, vertices uh, represent energy stored within the system. Edges um, represent energy moving within the system, and then we have sources and sinks, which represent energy entering, in the case of sources, and exiting, in the case of sinks, uh, leaving the system. So um, that's fine and good in practice. What this means is we can build up um, you know, our models, whether it's a battery, whether it's an inverter, heat exchanger, motor, generator, et cetera, as a directed graph. Um, now, um, the, one of the other things that's nice about this approach is that it's multi-domain, and I'm using the term multi-domain in this context in a different way than I did in the last presentation. So in this case, I mean, it, it spans between electrical, thermal, and mechanical, right? So you can have all three of these domains mixed together in this model. And uh, while these are individual components, um, obviously you can get a much, much more complex system overall when you combine these components together. So the first thing that happened was is that we were kind of given an idea. So when Chris came to AFRL, or came to AFRL, um, we, were given, we tried to get an idea of what their tool looked like. And we had, you know, when you have a summer student, you have like three months at the most to, to try and get something done. And the, the, the ambitions were pretty high in terms of what he wanted to get, get done because he wanted to do um, gradient-based sizing. He wanted to then move on to feedback controller sizing. And he wanted to move on to topology optimization of PTMS systems. That's a little bit much for three months. But, um, so, so, but we had to tailor the work um, to you know, a fairly aggressive schedule. And so this is probably my fault, actually, <laughs> is that I thought, OK, you can just, as long as you know the gradients for every single node and edge, it's no problem. We can just make a really, really big open MDO problem, which I guess goes back to Justin's comment about arms races between applications and, um, and developers. So in this case, what we basically did is I, I told him, okay, start with this. Uh, you, you take every node and you make an open MDO, open MDO component. Then you take the edge, you do the same. Next node, you put into the n squared. Next edge, etc. So you end up with a group that, that constitutes, you know, in this case, a fluid tank. And if we're trying to make a, you know, larger system that contains multiple different, um, that contains multiple different components, obviously we're stacking this with inside the n squared diagram. Now. Um, the reason I was referring to the arms race um, that, that was mentioned before is because I think most people who've dealt with this before realize this is not the most computationally efficient way of, of programming an OpenMDO, but it's, it's very expedient. Um, I mean, very expedient. And, you know, at its face value, these are really small components and look really simple and really small and should be fast. As it turns out, because um, they could compare against their old tool, they were, this thing was being drubbed in comparisons. I mean, it was like time integration we were doing with Dimos and it was just getting killed. Um, so ultimately, Chris went back home and other Chris, not me. Uh, Chris went back home after the summer and said, you know what, we can do this better. And after a while came back and told us about a new approach that he, had, he and his lab mates had taken. And this revised approach uh, uses MATLAB and I know that a lot of the OpenMDO com community really loves MATLAB. Um, but um, basically, their, their original tool wasn't MATLAB. So they would use MATLAB to create the system definition, which was a workflow they were used to. So everything great for the PTMS experts. And then they would create, using code generation within that toolbox, they would create functions, partials, and then ultimately really quite important metadata. I mentioned that last point because that one's easily forgotten. And what almost happened to us on our aviation paper, and we luckily caught it, was that we almost were working with feet and meters, and I think NASA may be familiar with that, that problem. 
<laughs> so, um, so in other words, metadata meta is important. And so all those three points were assembled together into, I believe, a three group or three component um, system. Uh, there's interactions between these groups that I'm not showing, but ultimately this became, it was also vectorized, which is also important, and became substantially uh, more computationally efficient. And when I say substantially, we're talking in the order of 100 times faster. So it's, it's a lot faster, which all of a sudden made it feasible for the problems that we're looking at. So after this, um, I'm just going to give you a high level of what we did with this because the individual papers are A, available, and B, um, perhaps a little bit too much for this form. But I want to give you an idea of what we were able to do with this. And keep in mind, this is probably still on the simple side for this kind of PTMS modeling. So the first, well, debatable, and I'm not doing this chronologically because technically some of this work was happening at the same time. But um, basically what we want to do is we want to design both a vehicle at the same time as the subsystem, as a propulsion subsystem, and um, basically treat it like a rubber vehicle. Um, if this looks like a sailplane, that's because it pretty much is. Um, for, for those of you, of you who are not familiar with me, I actually have background in sailplanes and, and, and um, back where I used to live in Germany. So this is basically a sailplane with a propeller added to the front. And um, basically what we're allowing here is the wing platform shape to change. Um, the platform is modeled in open aerostruct. So also, you know, nice community tool that's out there um, provided by the University of Michigan MDO lab. And um, then on the other hand, we have a series hybrid system. And this is where I keep, where I want to stress that we are still looking at relatively simple systems, but this is a lot more complex system than, say, if a fluid tank and a cold plate. So you can do a lot of design with this, but we're probably still not reaching the limit of what this tool can do with this. So um, on the top, we have electric components in greenish or teal, I believe is that color's name, actually. Um, you know, we can take energy from the battery um, and provide over the bus and, and inverter to the motor which converts it to mechanical energy and ultimately into thrust via propeller. And then we have a generator that's driven by a shaft. In this case, we didn't actually model the turbo machinery or piston engine or whatever was sitting on there. We just had a torque associated with it. So basically, you can create electrical energy that gets sent through a rectifier up to the bus and then can obviously be sent to the propeller. This system obviously creates a fair amount of heat, so we did need a thermal management system for this. So we have cold plates on every electrical component. I will note, in case this is going through anyone's head right now, the battery in this model does not have any thermals associated with it. It doesn't mean one can't, it just means for this specific case, um, it, it doesn't. And so um, ultimately, we, this is a problem that we were running through Dimos that we, um, ultimately had the control variables where the torque of the shaft, the fluid uh, mass flow rate for those two, for that fork, as well as the mass flow rate for the heat exchanger to expel heat out of the system. Um, ultimately, um, we did this in a couple, tightly coupled system. I think I'm gonna have to rework my colors because I gotta say they're hard to discern from distance. But um, the, Ultimately, you know, we have an atmospheric model, we have a lift coefficient, drag coefficient, and aerodynamic forces. That's all pretty standard still within, you know, the min time climb problem that you'll see on the Dimos website. In fact, this is a modified version of that where we're not controlling angle attack, we're controlling the um, climb angle um, as, as a control variable um, and calculating the, the angle attack from it. And then we obviously have our flight mechanics as a component, but before that we have the PTMS, which is feeding the, the thrust force. So it's actually coupled in this case, tightly coupled to the ODE. And what we saw was pretty similar to what I showed earlier of what John and Rob had, had already shown in their optimization studies is that, you know, we do see a, a drop off in performance, an optimal, um, you know, optimal climb time if we model the PTMS system in there versus if we don't. And we also see quite a different, this, I'm only showing one thermal distribution because there's way too many components, it would be so small, no one could read it. Um, but there's quite a different profile in that. Um, interestingly enough, uh, the 
wing plan form actually was almost the same, but somehow a little bit different. I haven't completely had an explanation for that slight difference, other than, than to say that I, I, the uh, thermal performance and the trajectory performance is somewhat expected. So this is the aviation paper I was referring to, and there's a follow-on work that I'll talk about in a second. The second aspect, um, as I mentioned, Chris really wanted to deal with feedback controllers. Uh, Chris Axland, that is. So, um, and this is, this is a part where there really hasn't been that much work from that I can tell in terms of sizing this, at least not in OpenMDO that I'm aware of. But basically he took a, a started out with a really simple feedback controller system uh, that's a single input, single output system and uh, did, a, did an optimization and a sensitivity study with respect to the gains. And then he also, or well we I guess, um, looked at um, a much, much more complex system where there's actually multiple um, feedback controllers in the loop and this is a multi, multiple input, multiple output system. Um, like I said, I, I, I'm gonna provide the, the link, or not the link, but the, the information you need to look up the paper. I think it was actually a pretty nice paper and, and Chris actually um, managed to be one of the top three finalists on the best paper award for the American Controls Conference. So I, I think he did a really nice job with that. Um, so we have, I've talked about vehicle and uh, controller, uh, sorry, vehicle and subsystem optimization. I've talked about feedback optimization. Then the final step really is putting those two together, right? So this is actually work that's in progress. That's why I'm not showing results at this point in time. As with the effectiveness-based work, if you're interested in this, we have a paper that's um, coming out for SciTech on this front, um, where basically we're expanding the problem that we were looking at before um, to include feedback controllers that, that control the um, PTMS system and the thrust uh, or the propulsion system. Um, I will say that one of the big differences here as well is, is that we're aiming for a little bit more representative scenario because the previous scenario I was showing was a min time climb problem. Um, this case is, is actually something closer to you know, a fuel burn minimization problem uh, which will have constraints attached to it in terms of climb. So um, that's, that's future work that's coming out soon. Right, so I'd like to talk, th there's a few things I'd like to talk through on this front because um, I think there's some interesting aspects to this work. Um, the first one, again, is, is really not a head scratcher and as I saw Justin's reaction as, as I was presenting it to begin with. But um, again, it's my fault that we sent Chris down this road to begin with, but it was a feasible to way, way to get it done, which can be the right way of doing it sometimes. But as we found out, when you pay 100 times penalty on something, afterwards you might sit there and think, well, maybe I should redo this after all. So um, one of the key takeaways is, yeah, we were able to do this, this tool, tool development and get gradients with it and do optimizations even for moderately complex systems. But the initial implementation is flawed in terms of that small components may be easier, but they absolutely come with a substantial performance cost. So, if one has the time and one has the patience and I guess a good shrink, um, go for the complex uh, implementation. So um, that's, that's one aspect. I, I will say I'm, I'm really impressed by the, the tool that UIUC has put together on this front. It, it really is able to um, expand our, the complexity that we're modeling up, up front with the um, PTMS systems. And then there's the um, vehicle design aspect. And I started with S-curve, I think it's fitting I end with S-curve. The, I think that what, we are, we, what we've done so far, or, or what UIC has done on this front, actually absolutely moves this S-curve. How much is up for debate, but I do believe that it does. So using that PTMS tool earlier in conceptual design absolutely moves the S-curve to the left from my perspective. At the same time, including a tool, a PTMS tool that's able to model more complex systems, able to model feedback controllers earlier in design, absolutely also raises that level of confidence one has early in the design process. So with that, I will gladly answer questions if you have some.
Thank you so much, Chris. At this point, we have uh, five minutes for questions. If it makes you feel better, we fell into the same trap that you did. <laughs> um, I do actually think the way you develop things there is probably a good pattern, especially from a learning process. It's, a, it's always obvious in hindsight, things like that, but yeah. I mean, we, we developed a training exercise along the same route and then immediately realized that you wouldn't implement a production code that way ever. I mean, to be fair, I saw it coming from a mile away. I just didn't know any better way to deal with it that summer. Yeah, but I think not, not so much a question, but a comment. There's a general lesson to be learned there about even though OpenMDO uses a graph-based kind of language and syntax, I think this is a case where the like system setup design language is better done outside of OpenMDAO and then write a like like a domain specific kind of setup and then you write a compiler kind of thing, converts it to Python. I like that you were using MATLAB to write Python code. I think that's the way to go. <laughs> um, so I think that's a good design pattern to follow. I, I think Kim just disowned you as a PhD student. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's okay. But MATLAB to write Python code means you're transitioning away from MATLAB. That's the right way to go. <laughs> I was curious about, I guess, the nature of that overhead um, when you tried it the first way that with, that, I guess, the granular approach with OpenMDAO. Is that um, presumably that most of that's coming from OpenMDAO calls under the hood and, and whatnot? And I think it largely came from the partial derivative calls, actually, oh. I, but I'd have to double check. Um. I mean, it, it's like a finite element model where each node is its own component in Python. And OpenMDAO has some for loops over the sets of components, so. You, you get almost no vectorization, yeah, yeah. So it's just, you're just sort of paying the Python penalty there. Um, what can Dymos do to make the uh, development of feedback controllers easier on you and the simulation of feedback controllers? Um, I'm not sure I'm exactly the right person to answer that question. Um, I have a few former lab mates in the room who probably have heard me call feedback controllers voodoo. Um, so, like I said, I'm not necessarily the perfect person to answer that. I, I will say that in that paper I, I listed there, that Chris's paper, you know, the uh, American Controls Conference paper, he does go into the process he had to do to make it smooth. Okay. Because by nature, I don't, I don't believe it's smooth by, by nature. It's an anti-wind-up controller as well. So um, there, there were some steps he had to take. Um, I think when it comes to more complex controllers like MPC, which my understanding is that Chris punted on the moment it was brought up, <laughs> um, for his PhD at least, um, which is fair. I, I've done that in PhD topics too. Um, the, there's probably going to have to be some work on that. Um, I can't say that's necessarily Damos specific. but yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? We got uh, two minutes. So sure. you showed, um, talked about like a uh, decrease in competition for like for orders of magnitude. Uh, what about decrease in number of components that you had when you switched to systems um, approach? You mean how many systems it was that caused? How many components were? Um, I don't know off the top of my head. I mean, it depends on the complexity because there were two main studies run. Um, one was a really simple canonical example, which is fluid tank and cold plate with okay, know, so like circulation. That. So that's basically almost as simple of a system as you can get. Then we show, then he ran a hybrid electric system without the vehicle, and that has a lot more components. And especially if you're doing graph based, I don't know. If, 50 to 100 components? I don't, uh, minimum, I would expect, but I don't know. Yes. I mean, for the granular approach, it was never extended to the entire problem. Sorry, the granular approach? It was never extended to the entire problem. No, it was to the series hybrid. It just never was in the coupled context. And the reason I never got there is because um, by the time that we were doing the coupled work, it was already well, uh, well established that the cost was too large to, to bother with. I mean, we would have done it, but we would have waited you know, a few days for results. And in the meantime, Chris and his, and his lab mates went back and revised it. So we never did it for the couple design. Okay. 
One more question? We've got a question online. We got a question online. John, you, do you want to read that question for us? Hi, everybody. This is John speaking for Jeff Chapman, a researcher at NASA Glenn. He says, what type of meta models did you consider for the creation of your lumped models? Again, this is somewhere where I'm probably not the right person to answer this question. I do believe, <clears throat> I do believe that um, Professor Aline's lab has the capability to include lookup tables. I am not sure if we used it in this context, though. Um, so for complex models, obviously, you would have to include um, lookup tables to handle nonlinear relationships of, you know, uh, like motor uh, constants or stuff like that. I'm really out of my depth talking about this kind of stuff, but I'm, I'm a vehicles guy. Um, so I don't know exactly how they're dealing with it. I believe they are capable of dealing with it. Cool. Thank you.